Coming live from San Carlos, California, USA is our guest tonight. Welcome to this very special edition of the KJ Masterclass Live, the show which ensures that you profit from your, from your time spent here with experts either through their industry insights, information, or simply learning from them. And before I move forward, may I request you to subscribe, follow, like, and comment on whichever platform you are watching or listening to this show on. And today we have Mike Duffy, CEO of Happiness Wealth Management, author and philanthropist. Welcome to the show, Mike. Ajay, it is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you so much for your time. So we will learn from you how to live our best life now. And uh, you are the right person to you know, actually tell it. But let me ask you a few questions, OK? Mm -hmm. You have written five books on happiness, OK? You have been with a very senior position with Mary Lynch. Then you have worked with some of the most wealthiest of people in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Valley. Two questions. Did you find them happy? You know, it really depends on the person. Just like the average person, you know, half of them are happy, half of them aren't. It Money is not, it, it doesn't, um, you know, there was a study done by Princeton and it showed that in the United States, if a family of four made over uh, $70,000, they were as happy as Warren Buffett, who's a billionaire. So it really depends on the person. Okay, okay. And what about you? You have written five books on happiness. Are you happy? I'm extremely happy. In fact, every day gets sweeter every day. So, you know, I, you see, Ajay, 90% of happiness is due to gratitude. If you are grateful for what you have, as opposed to focusing on what you don't have, you'll be happier. Okay. Okay, Mike. So why are you happy? Is it because you have written books? Is it because you have lots of money? Is it because you were an MC at Woodstock 94? And you love for music? Or is it that there is something intrinsic about happiness that you could discover? Please yes, tell us. I, I'm happy because I choose to be happy. Every moment of the day, we're bombarded by negative thoughts into our brain. And we can't stop them, but we can ignore them. So, you know, also, I, I'm very, very good at forgiveness. No matter who does me wrong, they're automatically forgiven because I don't have time. Life is short to live in a place of unforgiveness. Okay. Okay, Mike. So, see, you are an accomplished person. The type of people you have worked with, wined and dined with, they were all accomplished achievers. What about common people? So two questions here. Why is there so much of unhappiness in the world around, in workplaces, in families? And how can an average person, a common person, increase their happiness? And you know how to live your best life now? Please tell us in detail. So Ajay, let me share with you and your audience my happiness formula. And it's for everybody. It's P plus P equals H. Purpose plus progress equals happiness. You see, happiness is a journey. It's not a destination. You know, a lot of people confuse happiness with when I get my dream job, I'll be happy. When I buy a house in the right neighborhood, I'll be happy. When I retire, I'll be happy. It's not about that. What I would encourage your audience is to take out a piece of paper and at the top right purpose and then progress under the purpose steps we all have multiple purposes in our lives i did this exercise 12 years ago i wrote down the multiple purposes of my life so number one be a great husband to my wife shannon under progress i wrote down the steps that we would have a happy marriage i wrote down every saturday night is date night okay 
my father on the morning of my wedding, by the way, both of my parents had a sixth grade education. They were from Dublin, Ireland. But my father decided that he would not be an unwise man. He would become a very wise man by reading a book a week. So on the morning of my wedding, he said, Mike, it's much cheaper to hire a babysitter than it is a divorce attorney. Okay. So I, I took that to heart. You know, I, I'll be with my wife 21 years in September and we're happier now than we ever were. Okay. Then the next step, be a great father to my two kids. The progress steps, coach them in every sport they play. Right. And that, that builds the bond. It, you're there when they're down, you're there when they're up, and you create memories with them, okay? And then on and on and on, you know, put in a work purpose and, and things like that. So as you are making progress in your purpose, that's when happiness shows up. Okay, so when we see a lot of unhappiness around, and, and I can tell you, it's like you can feel it. So does that mean that lot many people are moving with, with their lives without the right purpose in their lives? Is it like they are zombies in terms of not having, you know, understood their purpose about their life? Yeah, look, Benjamin Franklin, who was a genius, uh, said that only 1% of people are successful because only 1% of people write down their goals. You see, when you write down your goals, you start your subconscious mind at work. Okay. Have you ever driven to a place? And when you got there, you said, I don't remember driving here. Your subconscious mind took the, you there. You plugged in the coordinates. You say, okay, I'm going to drive to work. It, you didn't, you know, have to be like, oh, I need to make a right. I need to make a left. Your subconscious mind knows where it goes. So by writing down the purposes of your life, you are setting those GPS coordinates for your subconscious mind to take you there. Okay. Okay. So basically, uh, we got to, you know, more focus about our purpose. Once we decide on it, then we make, uh, we actually focus on it, isn't yeah. it? But even though, even though you may not be focused on it all the time, your subconscious mind is. Okay. So a person who wanted to be a CEO or wanted to be a big businessman or wanted to be a politician, uh, why is he unhappy? Several of them. Again, you have to choose. To, so here's, here's the story. Here's how our caveman brains are designed. So our brains are millions of years old and they were designed to find out what is negative in the environment so that you didn't walk off a cliff so that you didn't walk into a den of tigers and say, Oh, this looks like a great place to lay down. So we're always looking for the negative. You have to reprogram your mind, whether you're a businessman or wherever you are to say, you know what? I'm going to be grateful for the things that I have. I'm going to be kind to people. Now, one of the reasons why my dad said to get a babysitter every Saturday night, he explained to me the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity states that when you are kind to somebody else, it is in our normal, natural human behavior to want to be kind to the person that was kind to them. So, you know, a thousand years ago, St. Augustine said that it is in giving that we receive. Right. A lot of people don't understand that. And the more you give, the more you'll receive. You know, one of the most popular Beatles songs of all time, you know, on, on the uh, Sgt. Pepper's album, it says, and in the end, the love we take is equal to the love we make. Be a kind person. Be generous. Be, be generous with your time. You don't have to be rich to be generous. Make sure that you take an interest in somebody. It means a lot that other people care about you. Be a giver. Then happiness will show up. Okay. Okay. So, Mike, uh, now let us look at it. The external reasons of unhappiness in several people's lives. One is 
that I have found my purpose. I am happy. But the environment around me does not let me be happy. They let, there is, there are people around in the society, in the neighborhood, in my office, in several times within the family itself. And everywhere I got to get my work done through them with them. A lot of people spread toxicity, negativity. How do I find my happiness amidst this sort of the present day environment? Look, it's not difficult. Uh, it, it's difficult being a human being, right? <laughs> Trying to be happy, right? And I have found, you know, I was doing, I do a lot of guest speaking and I was doing a, um, I was doing an event for a Canadian nonprofit that resettles refugees. And the, the, the bulk of this nonprofit are uh, volunteers. So they're doing this for free. And, uh, you know, it's very engaging. You know, these people are very afraid and things like that. So these are good people. And I did my talk. It went over very, very well. The next day, I get an email from the organizer, you know, who ranked me five stars on the talk. And she said, Mike, I got an email from somebody who listened to you and it was very negative. She says, oh, it's very easy for Mike to be happy in California because it's so sunny. And it's very easy for us to be, you know, safe here in Canada because we all have enough to eat. But why are we talking about happiness when there's a war going on and when there's people around the world that can't have enough food and la, 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 on and on. And. The organizer said, you know, I, I don't understand this. You know, um, what what should I say? And I said, in all of my years, because I have been investigating happiness now for 38 years since I was 17. And I said, in all of my years, I have found that those who choose not to be happy resent those who do. You can't change other people. It's hard enough to change yourself, right? You can't change them, but don't let them steal your happiness. You just have your bubble of happiness around you. They want to be toxic. They want to be unhappy. So be it. You can't make other people happy. Just choose to make yourself happy. Okay. Okay. So you are smart. An individual is smart. He can still find his way among all this. But what about children today? In this whole environment of social media, so much of hatred everywhere, you know, cancel culture. They have they are growing amidst all this. And they are also picking a lot of negatives from this, however positive they are. How do you teach your children to be more resilient? So that they can imbibe your qualities and are able to deal with the toxicity that is now or coming in the future. So, you know, I founded the Happiness Hall of Fame, which recognizes, celebrates, and encourages people and organizations that make other people happy. In the hall is Muhammad Ali, Deepak Chopra, Tony Robbins, the Make a Wish Foundation. The Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry, San Francisco Giants, the Calgary Flames, Serena Williams. But in the hall is a sports psychologist named Dr. Kevin Elko. And he addressed that issue that you just brought up about the children and about social media and about how they compare themselves to people like the Kardashians, who are billionaires, who can do whatever they want, drive whatever their car they want, wear whatever clothes they want. And he said, you don't know how hard those, for example, the Kardashians' lives are. All you see is a polished product. You don't see when the cameras go off how miserable they could be, right? So stop comparing yourself. This is what you tell your children. Don't compare yourself to the rich people on social media. Compare yourself to yourself yesterday that's it did you did you learn something in the last 24 hours 
Did you sharpen a skill, maybe in sports? Were you kind to your parents? Those are the important things that you have to tell your children. Okay. Okay. Now, coming from children to spouse, how do you uh, maintain, you know, with, with the spouse, there is always that uh, sometimes, you know, uh, there is always a difference of opinion about so many things. So how do you maintain a very happy balance with the spouse? Just love them. You know, my father wrote poetry for 50 years, even though he had a sixth grade education. And if I were to cull all of my father's poetry, and he was a very wise man, into one line, my favorite line of my father's poetry is, love is the center point of living. Love your spouse unconditionally. You can't drop dead of love. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I'm so frustrated. Love even more, okay? Wash over them like a tidal wave of love. Be grateful for your flawed spouse and your flawed sp and your flawed self, okay? They've got to put up with you. So the more you love them, the more you'll get along. And what you always want to try to do, and tell this to your family. So for example, my wife uh, is a top executive in tech. She's now in Hawaii. She left at 2 o'clock. My daughter's 17. My son is 13. And they said, uh, let's do something today. I said, sure. What do you want to do? And they said, well, let's just go to the mall and buy stuff. I said, no. I said, that's, that's not making a memory. Come up with something better. And they said, okay, we want to go to Pier 39 down at Fisherman's Wharf. And I said, okay. As we were pulling out of the driveway, I said, this is how today is going to go. We are going to focus on laughter. We are going to focus on good times. Even though we're going to a place that's very fun, has a lot of tourists, fun things to do, you will have disappointments. Your, your expectations will not be met in every facet of today. But even though things won't turn out perfect, we won't attack each other. We won't complain. We're going to focus on the laughter. I said, do we have that agreement? Yes. We had a fabulous time. We really did make the memory that I wanted, as opposed and, and for, and for the three of us. So it's well known in my house, and, and my wife knows this, that all I want out of life is peace and joy and happiness. And so if you come together as a group with that understanding, you will have a much better life with the people that you love. Okay. Okay, Mike. So, Mike, you are into wealth management. You have been into wealth management for such a long time. And a lot of people think money brings, you know, wealth brings a lot of happiness. You are into philanthropy. You wrote books on happiness. Uh, did you write a book on saying that, But you know, earn more money, create more wealth and be happy? Uh, you could have easily spent your time in earning more wealth, if we are already in wealth management. Tell us about this, your choice, moving into happiness. Okay, so money's not gonna make you happy. The secret is out. Uh, look, currently I'm building a happiness children's medical clinic and a happiness playroom in a children's ward in Kenya. And this has brought me great joy, having more Having more digits on my monthly statement has never brought me joy. It is in giving that we receive. And life is short and give your love and give your time and give your kindness to other people. In that way, you will become wealthy. It has nothing to do with money. Okay. Okay, Mike. So tell me, how do I know I am happy? You'll know. You'll be smiling. You'll feel at ease. You look forward to the day. Look, again, let, let me go back to how to be happy. Happiness is a choice, right? We're bombarded with negative things and just, just ignore them, okay? Now, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to put through this lifelong exercise of batting away the negative thoughts 
forgiving people that hurt you. First of all, when you forgive somebody who hurts you, that's a selfish act. You do that for yourself, not the other person, okay? But the reason why is because happy people are more likely to get married and stay married, are more likely to make more money, are more likely to be satisfied with life, and are more likely to keep and make new friends, okay? So does that sound good? All you have to do is choose in those moments of decision to stay in peace and to stay happy. When you stay in peace, you stay in power. When you stay in power, you can be successful. When you're successful, you're happy. Okay. Is happiness about being in peace? Should I understand that? Yeah. My definition of happiness is excited contentment. Okay. It's being excited about life. Exactly. Because you've set all these things up. Right? I have a I have a, a, a homeless outreach. You know, Mother Teresa had a profound impact on my life. When I set up the hall about a, a decade ago, she had already passed away. But I, I called up the local convent and I said, we would like to induct you into the Happiness Hall of Fame. And we're going to have a big event at Stanford University Faculty Club. We'd like you to come out. And, you know, I'll be filming you and you get your message out. We'll even fundraise at the event. And the, the head nun said, Mr. Duffy, I, everything has to go through India. So let me call the headquarters and I'll call you back. About three weeks later, I got a phone call. And she said, we can't come to the event because we're not allowed to be filmed. And so she says, but you can come up to the convent and you can give us the award. Just don't take a picture. I said, fine. Now, the reason why they are not allowed to be filmed is because they don't want individual stars to rise above the collective of the group and what their mission is. So I went up there and I took my nine-year-old daughter at the time. I said, Kendall, you have to meet these amazing women who give their life for the poor. They take a vow of poverty themselves, right? So we went up there and I brought two dozen cupcakes. And in the Bay Area, we have these very expensive cupcakes called sprinkles. So, and they're beautifully decorated. They look like a work of art, each one of them. And when I handed it to the Mother Superior, she opened up the box and she said, oh, Mr. Duffy, these cupcakes are so beautiful. Our friends on the street will love them. And it was at that moment, Ange, that the scales fell from my eyes and I stopped seeing people, homeless people on the street as not down on their luck, but as my friends. And, you know, as, as a result of that, I, I've, I've really made a connection with a lot of people. And by my daily giving to my friends on the street, it recenters me and shows me in detail what's important in life. Okay. Okay, Mike. You are the founder. Yes, Mike. Yes, Mike. You are the Are's founder. Me. Yes. Uh, I didn't say anything. Okay. So you are the founder of the Happiness Hall of Fame. What was the criteria to include, include people into that? First of all, they had to be good people. Okay. And they had to make other people happy. Okay. So when, when I inducted the San Francisco Giants, I did research. Now, they're a baseball team. They've won three World Series. Um, and... I, I wanted to see that they made people off the field happy, which they do. So I had been visiting with my friend Zach, who's homeless, without the ability to stand. He has to drag himself around by the knuckles in order to move. And after six months of visiting with Zach, I said, Zach, tell me what your dreams are. What are the desires of your heart? And he said, my, my dream is to meet the baseball players of the San Francisco Giants. And I said, let me make a phone call. Let's see if we can make this happen. So I called up the San Francisco Giants who had come out to Stanford University to our event, who brought their three World Series trophies, and they talked about how they make other people happy off the field, not just during the games. 
And I said, can you make this young man's dream come true? And they said, Mike, we will not just make his dream come true. We will have you take him out here during our premier game of the season against our hated rivals, the L.A. Dodgers. And when we showed up, they had bags and hats and scarves and stuff that he loved. And as I wheeled Zach onto the field, on this beautiful baseball field, with the players waiting to greet him, he turned to me and he said, Mike, this is the greatest day of my life. And I said, Zach, this is one of the greatest days of my life too. Because St. Augustine said, it is in giving that we receive. So I induct the givers. Okay. Okay, Mike. So in in terms of, you know, what are the, if you remember anything uh, that from this, you know, celebrities and all, all those inspirational figures in the, in your hall of fame, uh, would you like to share something? Yeah, you know, you know who Muhammad Ali is, right? The great boxer. So Muhammad Ali and his wife invited me to induct them personally into the hall. So I flew out to Louisville, Kentucky, where they have a museum. And I heard stories that I had never heard of before. You know, a lot of things that are associated with Muhammad Ali is his bluster. I'm the best, right? I'm the greatest. Right? He would say that all the time. But Muhammad Ali was a very gentle man. Did you know that he didn't like boxing? Because he didn't want to hurt anybody. And he was such the opposite of what we have, think about him today. Because, you know, it was explained to me that in order to have people from all around the world have an interest in this one boxer, he had to have a persona that was so over the top, so outrageous, that everybody had to say, is he going to win? Can he back up his words? Now, if I were to ask you today who the heavyweight champion of the world is in boxing, do you know, Ajay? You probably don't know who the, who the champion of the world is in boxing. There is one, but he didn't have that persona that Muhammad Ali adopted. So I was told a story that Muhammad was such a generous man that when he lived in Beverly Hills, California, they sell star maps to wherever the celebrities live. They sell them on the corner, right? And people, you know, walk around and point and say, oh, so-and-so lives there. Well, sometimes people would be bold enough to look at the straw map, go to the house and ring the doorbell. And this would happen all the time. And Muhammad, if he answered the door, would bring the people in. He'd say, oh, we're going to have lunch. We're going to have dinner. Why don't you eat with us? And then one time his wife was telling me, he would say, well, where are you staying? Oh, I, I just got off a bus from Kansas. I've got nowhere to stay. Oh, yes, you do. You can stay with us. There's this one guy, Jerry. And Jerry stayed the night, and Jerry stayed three nights, and Jerry stayed a week. And then finally, you know, Muhammad goes to run an errand, and his wife told me, I ran to the window, and I pulled down the blinds, and I saw that his Cadillac had made a right, and he was going into town. And I turned around, and I said, okay, you, you're out of here. And Jerry goes, well, Muhammad said I, I can stay as long as I want. Muhammad's not here right now. you got to go. And when Muhammad showed up, oh, where's Jerry? His wife goes, oh, you know Jerry, like a Rolling Stone, classic Jerry, had to keep on going. So that was one of the stories that really stuck with me, that you really don't know who these people are behind their public persona. Right, right. So, Mike, how do you have written five books? You have so much of experience with so many people, you know, and you are helping in your own manner to the poor people, to all the people, and then you've got so much of experience in your books. How do people get your books? How do they connect with you and get something, uh, you know, can get best, get the best out of you? Sure. So if you're a, a Prime member on Amazon, you can download my books for free. So go to Amazon.com. And my flagship book is the happiness book, A Positive Guide to Happiness. If, uh, you know, I speak all around the world, if you want me to come speak at your event, you can go to MikeDuffySpeaks.com. 
And if you're interested in the Happiness Hall of Fame, go to happinesshalloffame.com. There's great videos and great wisdom there of people who've been inducted. Right, right, Mike. So my last question, not a question, is like what would be one thing that you'd want to share with people so that they can be happy right now? So unfortunately, bad times are going to come your way. And in life, there's always a fork in the road. Do you choose when, let's say, you lose your job, you lose your spouse, you lose a loved one? Do you choose to stay in the lane of self-pity and say, this tragedy has contaminated me? I am permanently disabled as a result of it. Or do you stay positive and you say, this tragedy has made me stronger. I have grown and I have learned as a result of it. Always choose the positive path when you come to those forks. Right. On this note, Mike, it's a wrap on this edition of the KJ Masterclass Live. Thank you so much and spreading happiness in our lives. Thank you. Okay, it was a true pleasure to meet you. You're a good man. Thanks for doing this. I wish you the happiest of lives, my friend. Thank you so much. I feel blessed. Thank you so much indeed.